In medieval England, things such as bloodletting, public shaming, and punishment, barbers as doctors, and much more were common. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Let's explore several creepy things that were considered normal in medieval England. Bread might seem like the most boring, inoffensive thing on the planet, but throughout the Middle Ages and across Europe, each bite brought with it the potential for serious illness. The culprit was a fungus called ergot. Grains infected with it were unknowingly made into bread, and anyone unfortunate enough to get a loaf would soon descend into madness. The physical symptoms were easy to see, and the most drastic were arms and legs that would go gangrenous. But then there were also the hallucinations. A burning sensation led to the disease being called St. Anthony's Fire, and there are stories of entire communities affected by the fungus, with scores of them cutting off their limbs to try to stop the burning. And it was very common, particularly in the damp, cool areas of Europe. Many believe the illness was a sign from the divine. This is especially because of the whole burning and hellfire thing. And religious orders devoted to St. Anthony set up hospitals to care for the afflicted. A 15th century amulet found in North Lincolnshire suggests that St. Anthony was regularly invoked by people hopeful for his protection. Because no one wants to be in so much pain that cutting off their arms and legs seems like the only solution. There's an oft-repeated rumor that people in the Middle Ages didn't bathe, but that's not true. Historians have found scores of medieval texts that refer to the importance of cleanliness. It is next to godliness, after all. And the people of medieval England were a religious sort. It was widely known how important it was to be clean, but actually taking a bath was complicated. There weren't many people who had a bath in their own home, so communal baths were a huge deal. In the part of London called Southwark, there were 18 bathing houses, and here's where it gets weird. Since bathhouses were co-ed, it wasn't long before they got a reputation as places someone could get a little more than just a bath. Those Southwark bathhouses, for example, became brothels known as the stews. It was widely accepted that if you were heading to the bathhouse to get cleaned up after a long day in the fields, you were highly likely to see more than you bargained for. The medieval church took an if you can't beat them, join them sort of stance, and by the 15th century, the Bishop of Winchester was profiting nicely from a series of statutes he had drawn up to oversee the sex workers that were plying their trade at the Southwark stews. In the 21st century, kids are staying with their parents for much longer than had previously been the norm. Ma'am? Yes, hon? More hot pockets! Right away, hon. Take medieval England as an example, as told through a letter sent from a Venetian who was shocked at what he found in England. He wrote that kids were kept in their parents' home only until the age of seven or nine before they were sent to hard service in the houses of other people, binding them generally for another seven or nine years. That was across the board, rich or poor, boys and girls. Now, just imagine waving goodbye to your first grader and wishing them all the best of luck in life. Historians suggest that the ages of seven and nine weren't absolutes, and many kids ended up staying with their parents until they were somewhere between 10 and 14. The aforementioned Venetian indicated that a lot of it had to do with having fewer mouths to feed at home. It was also done to give kids a chance to learn a trade beyond what their parents could teach them. Still, given that most kids were illiterate at that age and time, even if they just went to the next town over, it was almost a guarantee they'd have next to no contact with their parents. People always love pointing out the flaws and mistakes of others, and in medieval England, they didn't have social media as a platform for that. Instead, they held shaming parades. The idea of public shaming wasn't just popular for hundreds of years, it was pretty creative, too. The specific punishments were often based on the crime. A tavern owner who was found selling bad booze might be forced to drink it before he was paraded through the streets. And then there are the examples that were made of pig thieves. They were escorted through the city with a dead pig hanging from their necks and a crown of pig's feet on their heads. The idea of this kind of public shaming went on for centuries and included devices like the pillory. Use of that particular method of shaming dates back to at least 1318, and it wasn't just a matter of sticking your head and hands through a board and being held there. Sometimes you were nailed there. People absolutely did die. Some were also pelted with stones, broken glass, and even dead cats, while there is a record of others falling through the platform they were standing on and slowly being strangled. No one likes to go to the dentist, but here's a positive thought. At least you didn't live in medieval England. Back then, anyone going to the dentist risked hearing that they suffered from an infection of toothworms. This weird concept is the belief that there were literal worms living inside a tooth and causing it to decay. Holes in pits and teeth were thought to be caused by a worm that looked something like a miniature eel. And getting rid of it? Instead of just pulling the tooth, a piece in the British Dental Journal suggested that more holistic remedies were favored. And no, that's not better. One way of getting rid of the worm was to take a candle made from sheep's fat and a mix of seeds and burn it as near the tooth as possible. 
The idea was that the worms would run from the heat and fall into the dish of water that was being held beneath the person's mouth. There's no mention how often that water was used to extinguish the unlucky patient. It might seem like a given that justice in medieval England would have been swift and bloody, but that actually wasn't the case, or at least that wasn't the intent. It's been found that there were far greater punishments than, say, losing a hand. Punishments that included public humiliation, fines, and being kicked out of a community. When violent punishments did happen, the point wasn't to cause the person so much pain that they'd be reformed, it was to mark them in such a way that everyone they met for the rest of their lives would know exactly what they'd done. In the early medieval period, the payment for many crimes was religious. A person might fast, for example, and it would be up to God to decide if more punishment needed to be delivered by the divine hand of justice. But later on, it became more common to chop off that hand or foot or just brand a person. Penitent man. Penitent man is humble. Kneels before God. Kneel! The practice of branding, usually on the face, was done into the 1800s, and most of the time you were branded with a letter that put your crime on full display. If you were convicted of blasphemy, for example, you might be branded with a B. Once that happened, it didn't matter where you went, everyone knew what you'd done. Being a medieval king might seem like it was the best option for making it through the Middle Ages with the minimal amount of muck, but it turns out that it wasn't all fun and games. Some kings were expected to cure an illness called the King's Evil, and it gets pretty gross. The whole thing started with England's Edward the Confessor, who was king in the mid-11th century. He became known for touching a person suffering from scrofula, the aforementioned King's Evil, and curing them. That wasn't the sort of miracle that anyone was going to let go, so for hundreds of years after, English and French monarchs were responsible for touching sick patients and healing them through what was believed to be an incarnation of the divine. Healing events were seriously large-scale, with one court held by Louis XIV reportedly welcoming around 1,600 people to be touched by the king. It's also worth mentioning exactly what scrofula is and what the monarchs were touching. Scrofula is basically tuberculosis, but outside of the lungs. It manifests with legions and swelling lymph nodes that can grow to a massive size and begin to leak pus, a little tidbit that's necessary to complete the mental picture. It's important to remember that in the Middle Ages, people got more up close and personal with the dead and dying than their 21st century counterparts ever do. Most people died at home, after all, and it was left up to the family to deal with the remains. It's not entirely surprising, then, to learn that there were a ton of stories about people who believed their loved ones had come back from the dead. While some of the tales are religious or clearly fictional in nature, others aren't. Belief in the Revenant, a reanimated corpse, goes back to the early Middle Ages. One tale comes from the hamlet of Drakelow and was recorded by Geoffrey of Burton. Villagers who were convinced that they were being visited by revenants dug up recently buried men and found them suspiciously intact. So they cut off their heads and put them at their feet, removed their hearts, and reburied them. How common was that? It's hard to tell, but when archaeologists excavated a 4th century burial ground in Suffolk, 17 of the 52 bodies had been buried after their heads were removed and placed at their feet. Some things are best left behind closed doors and the privacy of the bathroom, or at best, just discussed between a person and his physician. In medieval England, that idea definitely didn't extend to urine, and that was because of a widespread, long-held belief that the color, consistency, and taste of a person's urine could be examined to diagnose almost anything that ailed them. The practice of diagnosis by urine dates back to at least 100 BCE. That's when it was featured in ancient Sanskrit texts and hung around for a shocking amount of time. Fast forward to the late Middle Ages, and it was so common that people were skipping the professionals and just self-diagnosing. The very wealthy could even do it with the help of books that printed color illustrations of urine bottles and their corresponding diagnosis. The 13th century treatise on urines was exactly what the title suggests. What did it teach? The ideal color was clear, as it meant all systems were working properly. Wine-colored urine, or blue or black, was really bad. That is, unless a person had been dancing too much, then it was to be expected. And if it's green, death was knocking on your door. One of the biggest worries a medieval Londoner might have is whether they're going to heaven or hell. Rolled into that idea was that intercourse was reserved for the institution of marriage. Whoopi out of wedlock was a highway straight to the devil. But marriage was a little complicated. Many times there was no big ceremony, and there certainly wasn't paperwork and filing with various government agencies. A couple could be considered married if they, in the privacy of their own home, with no witnesses present, said, want to get married? And the answer was, sure. Or if a particularly surly priest happened to be on hand. Okay, here we go. A short, short version. Do you? Yes. Do you? Yes. Good, you're married. Kiss her. 
That's all that was required for a marriage to be valid, but proving it valid or invalid in the court of public opinion was something else entirely. The act of making love was also considered to make a marriage legal, because marriage and having a wedding were considered two separate things. Marriage was the institution, while the wedding was the big show put on for the benefit of guests. It was also believed that God was the only witness necessary, and considering God is always watching, consent could be made in private. Creepy? Yes, and people absolutely made everyone else's business their own. In medieval England, everyone was expected to cry freely. The creepy part comes when people judged others by their tears, including the quantity, duration of crying, and frequency. Tears have always been viewed as perfectly normal responses to terrible situations, but there's another kind, the gift of tears. This was essentially a sign that someone was thinking of Christ's suffering and becoming so overcome with emotion that they were moved to tears. These tears were considered a gift from God and set people apart as being particularly devout. However, cry too often, too loudly, or too much, and people would start to get suspicious that they weren't real godly tears. Take Marjorie Kemp, who cried so much that priests would have to shush her during religious services because she'd disrupt them. While some thought she was super holy, others suspected she was actually drunk, ill, or that she was possessed by a demon who was making her appear holy but getting it just a little bit wrong. The 11th century St. Peter Damien explained that this fake crying quote, did not come from heavenly dew, but had gushed forth from the bilge water of hell. The moral of the story? Be careful how you cry. It's one of those facts that's repeated a lot. Barber poles are striped red and white because they used to be doctors. The red is for the blood, the white is for the bandages, and pretty much everyone has heard this by now. Wait! You can't go, Dr. Barber! What if someone needs surgery, or even worse? An emergency haircut! But there's a little bit more to it. For a long time, barbers and surgeons weren't the same thing. In the early Middle Ages, master and apprentice surgeons were even classed and identified separately, which sounds like a very good thing. In the 14th century, barbers were allowed to do things like set broken bones and bandage surface wounds in addition to cutting hair. Surgeons, the people responsible for operations and amputations, were an entirely different guild. That was true until Henry VIII combined the two in 1540, well after the official end of the Middle Ages. And don't forget, medieval England's most popular medical treatment, bloodletting. The image of the leech is a famous one, but the creep factor alone makes it worth mentioning that there were other methods as well. Some tools were used for scarification, which scraped away patches of the skin, while other lancets were used to slice open veins, including the jugular. And you thought our healthcare system had issues. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.